Very good morning. Um, apologies that we've started um, started a little late, but we've been waiting for our fellow panelists to join, and unfortunately, uh, they haven't been able to up to now. But they may well do so as we go through the session. So, could I introduce myself? Um, my name is Tim Nicholl. I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor at Liverpool John Moores University, and I've got the, the pleasure of uh, chairing this particular panel. I wonder if I could introduce my uh, my, my fellow panelists. Yogesh, would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Yogesh Singh. I'm a corporate lawyer based in India. I mainly do M and A and corporate finance work, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this panel, uh, especially moderated by somebody as uh, well regarded as Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as I say, we're, we expect to be joined by two other panelists. Uh, we've been in touch with them, and hopefully they'll be able to, to join us. Um, I just want to say, before we start the, the conversation, just to perhaps provide some, some background. So the, the session is really asking us some questions about uh, the role of merger and um, acquisition activity in the context of cross-border relationships. And I think we're challenged to explore the question of whether political leaders are willing to enter into the M&A churn um, to simplify the proliferation of regional trade accords. Two specific issues are raised, which um, we will address in this conversation, I think. First of all, what mergers would make sense across Asia, Pacific, uh, Pacific and the African region? And which nations might lead such changes? And I think we're going to explore both of those questions as part of this discussion. Um, I just wanted to make four brief points, I suppose, before we, we uh, deal with the discussion. This is perhaps to contextualize things. The first is to note, as we all know, we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, this has affected all economies. I think it's really interesting that the discussion, certainly in the UK and many other economies, has been about supply side interventions. But it would seem that demand side considerations are driving much of the, the conversations at the moment. And particularly, there's that issue of confidence. And um, I noted that the, the 24th PwC Global CEO survey recently reported that 76% of CEOs expect economic growth to improve over the next 12 months. And that's a reflection of that confidence. The second point is just to note that um, there seems to be a significant amount of cheap capital floating around based upon the reports that are, are coming out. And um, these are coming from private equity. They're coming from the private market um, capital sources, but also the SPACs. And I think um, I did read a, a, an article recently that um, it was estimated that the capital held by SPACs yet to find a target amounts to half a trillion US dollars. Um, and this is suggesting that there will be fierce competition in the M&A market around that, um, that use of capital, which is very interesting. Thirdly, um, it's just the reports of what kind of M&A activity has been um, to the fore in the um, in the current period, and that is very much focused around, as we might expect, around technology, around media, around communication. And I think the point is being made that, um, first of all, during this period of COVID, that COVID has shown the resilience of larger companies, and there may be greater incentives now than ever for companies to scale and to grow um, through acquisitions. And secondly, COVID has shown the competitive advantage clearly lies with those who, during the period of the pandemic, have had access to technology. And, and in terms of product and service development, it's anticipated that um, many companies will continue uh, to seek out technologies. They're going to provide future competitive advantage. And that may, again, be the focus. And I think in the context of our discussion, that's a rather interesting point. The final is just to note, you know, coming out of COP26, uh, ESGs, terribly important. It's prominent in all debates now. And I think COP was interesting in that government, NGOs and business was present for the very first time. And the discussion of the um, the responsibilities of the capital markets was to the fore. And I think therefore net zero sustainability and the societal imperatives around um, EDI are going to be an important part of the debate. And I think will probably pop up in the discussion that we're going to have. So, um, those four points really just set the scene for what I hope will be an interesting discussion. Could I thank those who have joined us in the room um, and would really um, invite you to come and join the discussion as we're going along as well. And if you wish to, to take the microphone, please do. Um, so perhaps we could just with that, um, if we could, um, whilst we're waiting for our fellow panellists, just perhaps pick up any thoughts that you might initially wish to introduce in this discussion. So let me start with something very general and then 
a uh, couple of quick points on the very specific topic regarding um, proliferation of regional trade accords and the need for simplification uh, i think overall uh, i think uh, it's not a hidden fact at all that this has been one of the most robust couple of years for mna uh, i think 2020 especially after the second quarter uh, the way mna picked up uh, was quite significant Uh, there was a lot of portfolio management to start with, uh, but very quickly it changed, and there was a lot of uh, technology, uh, technology and uh, infrastructure-related investment that started coming through. Uh, when the second wave hit upon us, I think uh, there was a lot of expectation that there may be a slowdown, but by that time there was a lot of uh, uh, pent-up. Uh, energy amongst especially uh, funds and institutional investors who had been missing out on some of the consolidations that had been taking place uh, at the domestic level and what we saw as part of that was and we've already seen that in the first 11 months itself 2021 has broken almost all records uh, for m and a we are back to probably the largest ever volumes uh, but also if you look at the kind of uh, investment that are taking place so um uh it is across uh, the sector but obviously there are for particular themes so if you look at um, healthcare if you look at uh, energy and infrastructure uh, social infrastructure generally uh, fintech um, any kind of technology for that matter uh, there has been a huge proliferation in india in particular what we have seen is that uh there have been a huge number of unicorns we just this morning we had the 40th unicorn of the year coming up uh in india and obviously a unicorn is uh, not made out of your own uh money uh, the unicorns uh, sort of mean that there is a lot of investment that has been happening and there is still a lot more than powder um, uh, that is out there so i think as a result we see a lot of mnd activity uh cross border uh, financing activity in india already we are also seeing indian companies now beginning to look outside as well that had been a particular uh, area which had been slightly slow but now let's talk about specifically the the topic that we have which is more about would political leaders look at mnda as possibly a way to simplify the proliferation of trade accords see if you look at trade accords uh, why why do people get into regional sort of trade agreements uh, the purpose is to provide market access or economic growth job creation we get hello you sorry we seem to have lost you guys there just see if he comes back in the room uh comes out of those uh yeah. sorry we 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 lost you for for just a, a few seconds there so sorry so i was uh, saying um, i i saw a blip on the screen so basically uh, regional trade accords are meant for economic integration and to reduce trade barriers and they are in some ways sitting uh, opposite globalization because they are they're talking about a restricted group but uh, regional trade accords have been uh, pretty prominent especially in the south asian region india in particular has been part of several uh, trade accords but uh, some of the larger trade accords india has been outside as well now if you look at uh, the the drivers for this uh, at this point of time uh, what kind of uh, mnda could be a substitute or sim- simplify the need for regional trade accords uh i think in the past you have seen government or politicians led mnda mostly in the context of three key areas natural resources um strategic uh, assets so a lot of port road projects across africa are sort of uh, reflective of that and third is uh, securing essential goods supplies uh however anything beyond that is something that me as a private practitioner find i find it Uh, that maybe the government shouldn't be in that space given m&a for me is more of sale and purchase of companies where 
politicians should be thinking about mna potentially if at all they have to they should be thinking more in terms of healthcare waste management uh, water social infrastructure education uh, possibly supply chain augmentation but that is where i think the politician role should stop in terms of forecasting to your question tim whether or not what sectors do we expect uh, mnd activity to be very prominent especially around the region i think any kind of fintech or tech enabled business is ripe for taking uh, there are there is a lot of gunpowder with private equity funds and institutional investors so that will continue to be big energy infrastructure banking financial services uh will again be very very big and i feel that there is a huge opportunity on supply chain related aspects whether it be technology to improve supply chain or whether it be simply to build more supply chain uh assets i think both are huge opportunities where we see a lot of m and a potential because these are places where there will be a lot of regional play uh that we see uh in particular Okay, thank you. It's lots and lots of points to pick up on that. Can I just pick up on that last point that you're talking about in terms of the the areas? Um, in a previous discussion at a Horasis meeting, we talked about the impact of Industry 4.0, and um, it was quite interesting that in terms of of corporate strategy, this was reflecting upon not just the opportunities for for change, but also the structural impact it might have on. conglomerates and the way in which they were divesting themselves of perhaps non-core businesses that they were focusing very much about onshoring supply chains um using 4.0 as a means of um of entering markets within their own supply chain that were going to to create a number of differences do you do you see such structural differences impacting upon um the kind of activity you're engaged with at the moment no absolutely we 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 are we are seeing a lot of uh, that activity and you're right there's a lot of focus on uh, uh on shoring a lot of the activities that companies have been involved in if you look at india and the indian government's policies there's a lot of focus on this uh, hindi word called atmanirbhar which hmm. is essentially which means self reliance yeah. now a lot of people think of that as a protectionist uh policy but frankly uh it is not it's actually the other way around if people want to partner in that journey with the indian government there is a huge amount of investment as well as mnd opportunity which is out there uh given the need uh, that the what the government is trying to encourage is a bit of self dependency uh particularly in manufacturing uh especially focused on defense that has been sort of the key uh push that is there now when you look at onshoring of overall supply chains we are seeing a big amount of investment the other key aspect that goes very hand in hand with that uh tim is the whole digital transformation that that we are witnessing mm. uh and as a result of that uh that in itself has led to a huge amount of uh uh companies which were originally thought so if you look at a lot of the startups especially the uh, they were look they were being looked at as the outsiders who were trying to do something which was not necessarily thought of uh, they were very focused on tech digital kind of things i think if pandemic has taught one lesson it is that companies need to digitally transform themselves in a hurry and yeah. as a result a lot of those companies have been looking to acquire some of these uh, technology platforms to be able to Uh, include as uh, them as part of that but the other thing we've seen in india and we i was very recently on a show on the same topic is that some of these companies the uh, newer age technology platforms have become so strong that they have actually started acquiring mainstream businesses you're right yeah uh, as well and we've seen a couple of uh, billion dollar companies uh, in india which are unicorns actually or rather a billion dollar deals in india where a unicorn which is say a primarily a healthcare platform actually acquiring a very very mainstream pharma manufacturing uh, and r&d business because that is where they need to continue they, they that is where they feel that they will be able to uh, add a differentiator under the technology platform as a 
overall uh, service provider for that space yeah so we are we are seeing a lot of that activity and uh, you are very right at pointing out that that's probably going to be a source of several deals as well okay that that's, that's interesting thank you it was just that tension in the discussion between the the, the the way supply chains were being globalized and the discussion around 4.0 was was suggesting that there might be a reversal of that particular process and within that you'd have these structural changes can i pick up on the, the politics if you like of the um of the points you made which i think are really very interesting and um uh, it's really just about the um the motives if you like behind some activity that that, that will drive activity in the areas you, you mentioned before so you were talking about the acquisition of natural resources transportation etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but we see uh, as we were talking about just before we came on you know you see through the activities of certain uh, sovereign funds for example that the investment goes beyond those particular sectors i wondered if you had a view on on the activities of sovereign funds in the context of this kind of activity yeah so see i think uh, the 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 uh, uh, the the way we in india have been looking at a sovereign a lot of sovereign wealth fund investment we've been looking at that as uh, uh, and it is obviously very patient long term capital yeah it's meant to go into uh, businesses which generate cash over long periods of time uh, and a lot of those assets may require an initial gestation period to stabilize and to be developed for example a big uh, road uh, toll connection uh, collection uh, asset right it will take a lot of years for the road asset to be acquired by the government for a private guy to come in build the road uh, set up the whole technology around it and then for uh, the commercial operations to begin begin and only after one or two years of uh, stabilization that uh, sovereign wealth funds or uh, or the promoter is allowed to sort of Uh, exit some of those now that was t- t- historically how we looked at it but what we've seen is that a lot of funds are now actually very happy to look at even development opportunities and part of that is also because they are under the pressure to come up with the right asset base to be able to meet the payout requirement that they would face in the next 5 to 10 years in their home jurisdictions uh, right especially the pension funds the yeah. sovereign wealth funds are more about securing uh, the government but we are seeing a lot of investment from north america we are seeing a lot of investment from middle east uh, uh, because of our geopolitical situation chinese investments uh, ever since uh, june of last year uh, are being uh, reviewed by the government of india very closely and every investment where either there is a direct chinese investor uh, or and not just chinese investor it's any land sharing country uh, land border sharing country uh, investing into india uh, uh, then those have to be reviewed and even if uh, the direct investment is through somewhere else but if the beneficial owners especially a significant uh, part so anything more than 10% to 25% are sitting in land border sharing countries then the government of india wants to review them and those approvals haven't nasally come through now that was partly a response to the kind of geopolitical situation that was developing uh, and especially during the covid times also to the point that you've been making uh, that there was a lot of focus on making sure that the key assets are sitting in the right places there was a lot of distress and you didn't want some of your uh, companies to be sold at a cheap price or a strategic asset to go uh, in the wrong hands and therefore we are seeing some of those kind of policies coming in but then that is one part and it's a, it was a, a very significant part of the kind of investments india was receiving till 2020 uh but that has very quickly uh, been replaced by a lot of new investment coming from uh, europe us uh, and generally from southeast asia as well uh so uh, we are seeing some very interesting trends on the political part of that uh but overall except for land border sharing countries our uh, investment rules are pretty uh, are are very very uh, transparent and very open uh, that's the right word to use actually very interesting can i can i pick up on a, a, a just that that final point that i mentioned in my um in my introduction and that's just the impact of um 
of the, the issues kind of COP26, the issues around ESG, um, how that, how you're experiencing the impact perhaps of those debates on the kind of decision making that you see taking place in the marketplace? So see, let me let me give, provide an answer in terms of my experience as a service provider and yeah. what is the expectation from some of the law firms advising on uh, investment deals, right? First of all, ESG is uh, no longer a check, the, check in the box uh, yeah. system at all, right? A uh, very important uh, piece that I would say is that uh, if you were look, we, we had initial conversations about ESG in, from the early 2000s. And the conversation at that time used to be that is there a lot of uh, ethical non-compliance? Is there a lot of issues regarding child labor and other things? And we want people to be very focused on that. But the conversation moved from there and by the starting of this particular decade, the conversation was uh, how will you make sure that there is a proper ESG check? And in the last five years, now the conversation is about, um, and uh, many times the answer used to be uh, back in the start of the decade that we have, we will have a separate team looking at these things uh, and that is going to be good enough. But now the conversation has moved from that to much more effective focus. So, for example, in the past, if I pointed out uh, that there was a non-compliance, uh, the answer to that would be fine. Let's take an indemnity and let's make sure that the non-compliance is addressed as the condition is right. Right. But now the conversation is much more uh, sophisticated uh, and there's an additional layer. So the question is, why is there non-compliance? Is that the culture of the business? Then that's a red flag. If it is not the culture of the business and it's one of fine, uh, but how long is it going to take in a normal course? If by putting it as a condition precedent, am I forcing somebody to do something wrong uh, or ask for a favor and therefore why don't uh, we look at a, some kind of indemnity protection, but also give people the sufficient amount of time to be able to address an issue like that. So I think uh, that has been a big uh, change, but we are looking at uh, ESG no longer being checked in the box. We are looking at sustainability being a big theme. Uh, there is a lot of focus. There is a separate diligence normally that is undertaken. Any issues around that, uh, people are not afraid to raise those and talk about them very, very openly. Uh, and uh, diversity related aspects uh, or general ethical compliance related aspects have become very, very significant. The law has also turned in the meantime. So Indian law also now provides for uh, various protections to uh, female workers. Uh, there is a much more effective regime which has real teeth uh, in it. And there is a cultural shift that is uh, slowly but certainly beginning to happen. And that a lot of focus of that has come from the investors saying these are very important aspects and constantly bringing those conversations, even not just at the time of the investment, but even as part of the post-investment conversation. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of focus on that. And I feel that that's an extremely healthy trend, uh, given that these uh, the ESG standards are being mandated by the regulations or are part of the core commitments of some of the investors who are coming in. So to see those completely being replicated throughout the investment journey and then even during the post-investment time is quite hard. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I come from a, uh, an aspect of governance. That's my research area. And I think it's fascinating how, as you say, that that tick box uh, sort of attitude, which has persisted for many years, is changing. And um, the recent changes around integrated reporting, I think, um, that are now taking it at an international level, I think will lead to some very, very interesting developments in the disclosure of, of activities, which brings together the financial reporting aspect plus that, um, that the softer elements of reporting, if you like, around the ESG, which I think might... Um, might clarify the position internationally for a lot of institutions. Can I ask it? It's really interesting what you say because it's um it strikes me there's, there's sort of two levels of discussion. There's a level of the discussion at the at the corporate level, if you like, the entity level, and I think much of the debate around governance is focused on certainly in the UK is just the, the comply or explain um, sort of attitude at that that individual level. 
But I wonder to what extent, uh, and particularly in the context of this discussion, those ESG aspects will now take take us into the, the political arena, if you like, and focus not just upon the individual institution, but also the, the, the context in which that institution is operating, the, the geopolitical context which is operating, and that other factors external to the company itself might become relevant, I, you know, who owns it, where is it based, etc. Do you think that might come to the fore and the, an impact upon the activities you're, you're looking at in the future? It is. It is already uh, getting impacted. Uh, and when you, when, when they, and I'll tell you how some of that uh, comes out uh, during the conversations we have with investors in particular. Uh, we in India have a sort of quasi federal system, as you know. And, uh, and as part of that, states have a lot of autonomy on various uh, policing and local regulations that they have. And there are a lot of questions about what is the level of uh, compliance in this particular state. What are the kind of policies that this particular state has? So there's a lot of focus on some of those things and states which have uh, and Indian states in particular, especially under the current government are are running a race against each other as well. Uh, so uh, Gujarat or Tamil Nadu or UP or uh, Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh or uh, Karnataka, right? Uh, or West Bengal, they are constantly in a race in order to be able to establish that they are more investor friendly. And part of that is to by having very clear regulations around that. That goes a lot to the corporate governance and uh, the the basic asset procurement kind of procedures, yeah. which used to be a big problem as part of general and is generally a issue across uh, all types of emerging markets, uh, including in India. So uh, some of those uh, issues which have been identified uh, have gotten addressed. And therefore, uh, they are uh, they are being discussed a lot. Many times we get asked, what is the level of uh, compliance in this particular state? Uh, we have states where uh, some particular claims have been made, uh, say, by the government. Uh, then there's a lot of discussion on why and how this has been made and how it can be addressed and what has been the experience of other investors as well. So I think some of those uh, aspects uh, are already being talked about. Uh, external factors to the to the relevant company where the business is what is the regulation and frankly the it is an important segue into another part that you might want to consider which is the whole regulatory evolution that we are seeing almost on a bi-monthly basis mm-hmm. uh, right the regulatory evolution and especially because of some of the newer technologies so when say an uber uh, came into your country uh, what was whether the there was actually a regulatory framework that was out there? Uh, how did that evolve? Uh, what kind of issues have been coming up? Uh, but similarly, when we look at the big tech companies or say um, a Facebook, uh, what kind of issues that they are leading to? What kind of data privacy concerns are uh, coming up? Uh, then issues around cryptocurrency. Then issues around uh, online sales of goods and uh, insurance products. So some of those issues uh oh, we seem to have lost you. It's um Yeah, your guess it's um No Ah, back again. Sorry, we lost you again. It's, uh... Sorry, I was just saying that, look, I think some of those issues uh, are already being asked about. And in the context of regulatory evolution, uh, ESG itself is coming to the fore in, in many different ways because it's posing a very complex question to legal and compliance teams as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Now there is no legal team which also does not have somebody who uh, also deals with the regulatory interface because the evolution is of policy making is so much and companies have come to realize that the legal team is probably the best place to house that capability rather than uh, put that in a government affairs uh, department. Hmm. Uh, right. So I think uh, that is also leading to very interesting conversations uh, about that. And that is also an area where we see a lot of scope 
or uh, rational for uh, M&A because there are sometimes newer opportunities that come up or sometimes newer regulations that come up because of which an asset which may not be so attractive or a company which did not bother to get into a particular uh, zone of service or product uh, is now under pressure to provide that. And the best way to do that is to have an inorganic acquisition. So that's also a driver for m and in many ways. Hmm. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. In terms of the, um, I just think in, in terms of the, the focus of activity, does it, does this also represent a shift in what may be seem to be attractive to invest in in the future and therefore if you like drive drive a series of trends um so that there are certain things which become desirable because of, of their standing in esg terms and therefore become attractive to investors then we'll do you see what i'm getting at it's um it's, it's to what extent the, the esg will drive drive the agenda um in setting out target companies, setting out agendas for companies to aspire to in order to make them attractive in the marketplace so that they will they will signal certain things to the market and, and in doing so will therefore make themselves much more attractive. So. It is. It is. So uh, I'll give you one simple example. Uh, the number of companies in India which are now looking to acquire, get power from only renewable energy producers is significantly higher. Uh, and as a result of that, there are a lot of rooftop projects. There are a lot of uh, greenfield captive projects that companies are getting into. And that's a completely new product line uh, or rather a much bigger product line for the current power producers. Um, um, so companies are under tremendous pressure to have, to clearly showcase some of those issues um, as part of basic uh, employee opportunity and uh, uh, sustainability uh, when people are even evaluating base fundamental things like the employee value proposition. That's a big theme in the HR world. Uh, sustainability is a huge part of that conversation as well because even a college, um, a new uh, college graduate is asking the question, am I joining the right place? And the millennials in particular have shown propensity to ask the question and if they don't like the answer to actually follow through on that. Uh, I think in the past, uh, even if people were assured that in future the company is going to do it, but now I see clearly there is being a lot of focus. So a company which does not have good DNI policy, a company which does not focused on its uh, carbon footprint uh, is clearly disadvantaged even at, um, at, the, at the point of hiring employees. Uh, forget about raising capital from investors who have pledged billions of dollars towards uh, these causes. So uh, definitely something that we are seeing, and uh, it's uh, it, it, and def- and it's changing the shape of the conversation as well. Okay, does that? I've got all questions about leadership and all sorts of things flying off from that, but I'm conscious we're, we're coming almost to the end of that our time. I just wanted to, just one final question. Sorry, I'm bombarding you with questions in this uh, this thing, but it's fascinating okay. answers you're giving. And I just wanted to the extent to, if you take that ESG agenda, does it come to the point at certain at a certain point where um, actually investing in particular regions will become difficult or will become challenged um, because of an inability or an, an unwillingness of particular regional governments to move quickly on the agenda or to perhaps to have a bad um, a bad record in terms of, of the government response to the ESG agenda? Well, see, I, I normally would want to refrain from the political fallout of some of these yeah. things. But if you look at COP26 or if you look at the basic decoupling uh, between China and US, right? Uh, you can see that uh, at the geopol- at the political level also there is a demand for transparency, right? Uh, but even at the investor level, uh, as part of the ESG sustainability conversation, that is becoming a very big question to be asked. A lot of companies are under pressure that are you even if that a particular country is providing you the best investment opportunity potentially for in terms of returns. Is that necessarily the country where you want all your capital to be? At least that first level conversation I've heard multiple times. 
okay that at least we need to have move some of our supply chain out of this place purely because of lack of uh, transparency or the lack of focus on uh, environment related concerns so those first level conversations we had already seen yeah. now will people want to completely uproot themselves on this particular cause i think we are probably a little further away from that and i frankly think that that may not necessarily happen because the pressures are such that i see nobody having the option not to be focused on sustainability or on environment compliances uh, over a period of, over a long period of time i think yeah. everybody eventually has to show or demonstrate some level of compliance people will do it in their own ways and you and i will sit there and question whether or not actually something is happening on the ground or are these uh, curated reports uh, hmm. but nobody will be able to say that i don't care about this yeah. issue i think that is very out very very clear yeah and i think coming coming from cop26 it was interesting the first world business was there in such uh, such numbers first first of all but also i think there seemed to be an acceptance that um being part of the conversation even though people might not step up to the mark at the dates that were hoped for nevertheless the fact that people are part of that conversation means that there will be a transition and this will allow actual engagement to take place without the kind of barriers you've just um you've just identified being being put in a way to absolute um absolute non activity so yeah. very good look i'm i'm conscious we're now 5 minutes um away from the end i'm i'm grateful for people who've uh, attended the room i'm sorry that our two other panelists haven't been able to join us and therefore sort of um i've been bombarding you with questions but i think your own sort of response has been fascinating it's um and certainly have addressed some of the the issues that uh, were posed in the question around this activity and i think um i'm very grateful i don't know if there's anything um in terms of concluding remarks you'd like to to say before we we come to an end it's uh... yeah see i think i would just go back to the topic one more time about the whole regional trade accords uh, yeah. related aspect and how mnd could potentially lead to simplification of some of those things i yeah. think that is that is if that were to happen that would be fantastic uh purely because if you look at uh, the current issues let's say if you talk about the automobile industry right there is a shortage of semiconductors mm-hmm. right now uh, the semiconductors are now purely being rooted on account of uh, where the companies make get the best return right the same companies who are were current or to earlier very focused on uh having a footprint across and not having different types of margins in different geographies now all of a sudden they want to focus on uh the place where they are, they are getting the best uh, margins mm-hmm. i think that is the kind of thing where uh, some kind of a political level intervention to be able to make sure that economies are simply not being uh uh marginalized or are uh, not being focused on purely because some returns are not there even though yeah. in the past investments have been made i think those are the kind of things that uh, definitely uh, need to be thought about even at a at a political level and whether or not people can come together to address uh, those kind of issues yeah. uh, the other areas i see is uh, competition and technology i think just the fact that uh, competition laws need um, a bigger cross sovereign sort of involvement uh, and uh, technology companies especially companies which are focused on social infrastructure kind of technologies if those technologies can be out there and be made available <laughs> even with political uh, intervention i think that is probably something that will also go well and uh, even if that does not necessarily uh, come out of mnd but that is probably the limited role that i see for the politicians in this particular space but other than that i think uh, we are very uh, we should probably look at private mnd being left as it is companies will come in and acquire and invest across because of markets and variety of reasons and uh, given the now the sound uh, and it's a great angle that you bring in uh, tim actually that given the focus on sustainability 
even those economies which may not necessarily be throwing up the best returns will probably as long as they are compliant with other parameters that are important we probably see investment and uh, m and a happen there and uh, international companies being focused on those markets as well okay thank thank you very much i think we've we've come to the end of this conversation i'm sorry we haven't been joined by our fellow panelists but i've, I've certainly enjoyed enjoyed speaking to you and i hope um those who've sat in the you know the session have done it so we have a permanent record of course because we the stream has been recorded so thank you very much i wish you well for the rest of the um, the conference and so hey, thank you so much i uh, hope to see you soon thank you Indeed very is. much uh, to the attendees as well thank you thank you very much thank you thank you